Good evening. Hi, I'm Jose de Jesus, I'm Associate Director of the Centro de Estudio Puerto Riqueños, welcoming you to one of our great events. Uh, tonight we're honored to have Papoleta Menendez, Julian Manuel, two great poets, masters of language, who will have a dialogue about Papoleta's uh, recent work, and then uh, later on we'll be able to have a Q&A with the audience. Uh, about the Centro, uh, this is one of our events. All of you who came in signed at the uh, entrance table. Uh, there, we want to have you in the sign-in so that we can be able to communicate with you about all our events and the activities that we have. Coming in this, the Centro's 40th anniversary year. Uh, we've been around that long and we hope to continue longer. Uh, as you know, we're an educational research academic institution within CUNY and also here on 119th Street. We have our library and archives, which is the, the, one of the premier collection of Puerto Rican diasporic works uh, in, in the United States. And that's open to scholars, community folks to be able to review literature and other works that we have in our collection. We are at this stage in the 40th anniversary, of course, pushing as much as possible on the web. And we do have a website so that you can just go in there and see the myriad of materials and resources we have available to you about our community and its history and its culture. Um, outside, you would have seen our events calendar for this semester. Please pick one up so that you're aware of what's happening uh, in, in, during this semester. Uh, another thing that we have out there is a Frank Bonilla Scholarship Fund. Uh, this is made after uh, the death of our founding director, Frank Bonilla. Some of you may have known him. Uh, this is a scholarship to give to undergraduate students who are, are in our, studying our, our field and have some cash awards to help them continue with, the, with their studies. Um, Again, this is our 40th anniversary year. We welcome you here. At the end of the conversation, uh, in outside, uh, the book, Papaletos Hey Yo, Yo Soy, is available for purchase. And we will have uh, some food and snacks for you right after this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And now, let me turn. Let me present to you Uraya Manuel, assistant professor of English at SUNY Albany, who will moderate the discussion. Okay. Is that good? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Yeah, chévere, chévere. So thank you, uh, Jose. It's great to be here. Welcome to Centro. It is my joy and honor and privilegio uh, to share with you in this conversation with Papoleto Melendez. Uh, I will start off by reading the uh, bio the uh, accompanies the back cover of this wonderful book because this is after all an event in celebration of this book and then I'll say some words, uh, uh, largely personal words, very briefly uh, about my uh, engagement with Papaletto's work as a, as a poet and, and as a scholar uh, and then I'll let Papaletto do his thing. So Jesus Papaletto Melendez is a New York born Puerto Rican award winning poet most associated as one of the founders of the New Rican movement he is also a playwright, teacher, and activist. Melendez is the recipient of the Luis Reyes Rivera Lifetime Achievement Award 2004 and a 2001 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Poetry. He currently teaches and resides in El Barrio, New York. Uh, so I will just say that I uh, uh, know Papoleto from the uh, from the scene, from the poetry scene, right? Uh, 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 Puerto Rico, uh, uh, Puerto Rican specific and otherwise. Um, but I also know him in a scholarly capacity. I did a uh, my scholarly, my doctoral dissertation at NYU on uh, on the uh, history of New Rican poetry. Uh, and I'll just say, as a kind of personal um, nod to both Centro uh, and to Papaletto's work, uh, that I scavenged in my capacity as Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow here at the Centro two years ago. I scavenged the stacks, right, looking for Papaletto's early work and reading a lot of the work that's contained in here. And I was moved and inspired by uh, the complexity, the beauty, the adventurousness of this poetry written by a very young man, right, uh, 
this is pretty much a teenager starting out, right? And I think the the uh, the ideas that we maybe have about what uh, 1960s, 1970s poetry was in a Puerto Rican context and more generally, right? Might have this idea that poetry was always political in an obvious way or was always uh, uh, doing a particular kind of thing aesthetically or formally. And I think works, works like Papoletos from the era show the complexity, the, the diversity, the risk taking uh, that was happening uh, at that time on a kind of social level. But of course, it's also a testament to his own. Uh, continued development as a writer and artist and activist over the years. So I had the good fortune of engaging with that work as a scholar because the Ford Foundation afforded me the time to be here uh, like a geek with a whole bunch of archives and, uh, and dusty papers. And I'm so thrilled and excited that now we all have that opportunity because this work, I think, justly uh, and in long overdue fashion is being made available uh, to all of you. So, so my plug is as a poet who loves this work, but also as a scholar who knows how many of the foundational works right, of uh, the Puerto Rican diaspora are still out of print, are still largely unavailable, have still not been widely distributed, have still not get, have been given the recognition they deserve. Uh, so on that note, I make a personal but also professional appeal to you uh, to join me in celebrating the beauty and the power and the transformative energy of, uh, of this work. Uh, so with that, I will leave, uh, leave uh, Papoletto uh, 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 the stage so he can uh, share some of his work, and then we'll move on to a, to a Q&A and uh, take it from there. Uh, so what do you want me to do? You want me to read a poem? Um, <laughs> I, 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 first of all, that was very nice when you said everything. I, I, I'm glad you did that research. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah. I'm glad you did the research with the Ford Foundation. You got a grant. I like a Ford grant. <laughs> <laughs> and to research my own stuff. Um, but interesting you say that because, um, well, you know, these poems, mo these poems are at least 40 years old, um, most of them. Um, are we going to talk about that? Can we talk about that? Sure. Or, I mean, uh, you want to want to start off? Uh, give yeah, I want to start off talking. I'll read later. Oh, okay, you, want, you guys want to okay. hear a poem I'm or you want me to share talk? Uh, I can share. Okay, okay, I'm going to share. Let's do, oh, you let's do a short one, maybe? A short one. Yeah, yeah, let's do yeah. Super Pig together. Oh, that's the time. Yeah. Page 100. Like the, 101 for okay. you. So if you have the book, I don't know, we're selling them outside. Yeah, that's, I was hoping, you know, because see, to me there's nothing more fun than buying the book and then reading along with me. Because uh, then you get to see what happens on the page. That's, that's what I, I say. Okay, Super Pig. Now, Super Pig was written around 1971, something like that. And, 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 <laughs> and watch what happens. <laughs> okay, You're gonna, I, I'm going to read it first in English. And, and Ura, you are you reading in Spanish for me? Okay, cool. Okay, here we go. It's short for me. <laughs> okay. Faster than a roach running from a spray can. More powerful than steam coming up on winter days. Able to leap garbage cans in a single bound. Look up in the sky at the block on the corner on the stoop on the roof on the fire escape in your house in your mama. It's a bird, it's a junkie, it's a pusher, it's a friend. No, it's super big. Yes, it's super big. Ta -da -da. Ta -da -da. Strange intruder from another block who came into our communities with strange powers and a gun. Super pig who can change his course in seconds flat when he sees niggers dealing drugs to our beautiful youth and smiles as he watches us killing one another, then steals from our poor and exploited people. Super pig! And who disguised as the junkie on the block, the pusher on the corner, the number taker, the money maker, fights a never-ending battle for Nixon and his friends with liberty, justice, and that gun of his, the American way. Pigs, if you all think you're supermen, unity is kryptonite. <laughs> and then we'll talk about that. But let's hear it in Spanish. Thanks. I'm excited. Okay. Uh, 
Super Puerco Policía. Más rápido que una cucaracha que huye de un aerosol. Más poderoso que el vapor que surge en los días de invierno. Capaz de pasar zapacones de un solo salto. Arriba, en el cielo, en la próxima cuadra, en la esquina, en la entrada, en el techo, en la escalera de incendios, en tu casa, en tu mamá. Es un ave, es un tecato, es un traficante, es un amigo. ¡No! ¡Es super puerco policía! Sí, es super puerco, extraño intruso de otra cuadra, quien entró en nuestras comunidades con poderes raros y una pistola. Super puerco, quien puede cambiar su curso en solo segundos cuando va a los negros desgraciados vender drogas a nuestra bella juventud y sonríe mientras nos mira matarnos unos a otros. Luego les roba a nuestros pobres y al pueblo explotado. Super puerco. Y quien disfrazado como el tecato en la cuadra, el traficante en la esquina, el boletero, el buonero, lucha la interminable batalla. Por Nixon y sus amigos, con libertad, justicia y esa pistola de él, el estilo americano. ¡Puercos! Si ustedes creen que son superhombres, la unidad es la kriptonita. in Spanish before. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's great. <laughs> But that's a good... Uh, can we start there? Let me sure, just say something. Sure. Okay. Now, Super Pig, when I was a little kid, I used to watch Superman on TV. And, you know, George Reeves is Superman. And, you know, the theme song, -da 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 -da, the whole thing, right? Now, I listened to the guy, to, to the uh, narrator, right? Now, I always thought, he said, I'm listening to this thing as a little kid, right? This Superman superhero. But I always thought he said, Den steals with his bare hands. And it was incongruent in my head. I said, well, how could he do all these things? And then he's a thief. He steals with his bare hands, you know? I was confused. You know, just like, I always thought, like, post no bills. You ever see that post? I, I said, well, who the hell would want to paste money onto the damn wall in the first place, you know? <laughs> so I walked around with these stupid idioms in my head, you know, like that, you know, post no bills, oh, power to the people, right? I had to forget about it. I find it, it made no sense for the longest, you know? Um, but anyway, um, the thing is that since I thought it was Den Steels with his bare hands, right? When when the when the 70s came around and we were having all this trouble with the police and we you know the the, the Black Panthers had called them pigs and they had their, their the Black Panther paper always had the, the police showing up with with flies they looked like pigs with flies around them and everything so then I thought to write Super Pig right so as and I figured out a long time ago that you know we were the Kryptonite right but that wasn't the problem you know but it was that. Then steals with his bare hands, you see? So to me, that was like, how can I say it? That was my glue. That misunderstanding was my glue to convert the poem into something else, you see? Um, and to convert that dialogue into this particular poem. That's yeah. what I mean. And also, uh, the use of, well, Nixon was president. So he's mentioned in there. I tried to change it over the years, but it's more fun just leaving it Nixon. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, you, know, you can't make poems contemporary. They're contemporary for when you wrote them. And then they live on in that contemporariness. You see what I mean? They, they capture that moment. And when you keep changing them, <laughs> they're going to keep being something else, you know, and, and never themselves. Um, I have a question on, on that note. And nigga, I wanted to say. I'm Ooh, sorry, so nigga, either, I wanted right. to say about nigga. Um, because in those, you know, this is 1971, you could say that. I mean, you know, now I, 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 that's something else I tried to change in later poems, in later versions, and made it like an exploiters. Because that's the meaning that I'm, that I'm inferring in the poem. But it just happened to be, you know, a, 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 a bunch of uh, black youth selling, you know, us drugs. So that's how that went. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering about the mixture of uh, popular culture on the one hand and, and city life on the other. Because I see that in a lot of your early work. There you have, like, uh, Superman and right, Nixon. 
but you also have the reality, right, of life on the street, right? And I think that you, 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 there's a beautiful, for those who haven't read the book, there's a beautiful preface in the book, and I think you write about both of those things, like being a, as a kid, right, watching Mickey Mouse on TV, but also being influenced by the sounds of the city, life with your neighbors, right, right? kind of the life in El Barrio, right? So I wonder if you could talk about how those two poles work together, the, 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 the popular culture aspect, and just the reality of, of, uh, of the city uh, in your work, or, or El Barrio in particular in, in your work. Well, like the, the preface, yeah, the preface is worth reading. The whole book is worth reading. There's a lot of good stuff in the book. Uh, I mean, it surprised me, which, you know, hopefully we can get into that. Um, but what I, oh, somebody, no. Oh, okay, this is more. Um, uh, you know, I like to, I think of myself as a little stupid little kid when I was a kid, you know, like just, you know, really like didn't know too much stuff. And so, like, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure things out for myself. So then I have these weird notions about things, you know, that are not totally the truth. All right. Um, so, you know, in the preface, I talk about Mickey Mouse being my literary influence. Now, Mickey, you know, people say, hey, Mickey Mouse being your literary influence. And then some people get mad because it's not, you know, some Puerto Rican writer. That is, no, you know, my house, there was not that much literature in my house when I was a kid. There, I, I don't remember novels or anything like that. When I was in the Boy Club, we used to do plays. I would bring the plays home. So that was like foreign literature that was in the house. You know, other than that, the newspaper, school books, stuff like that, you know, not novels. You know, I know, you know, some people had a whole encyclopedia set. They bought each one for 99 cents, you know, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. But at least they had that. I mean, you know, I didn't have that, you know. Um, so watching television, which was my window to the world, I talk about this. Yeah, Mickey Mouse was like, I was into Mickey Mouse. I wasn't into the Mickey Mouse show. I was into the cartoons, because I've always liked cartoons. Because cartoons, if you think about it, are very surreal. You know? Like, I don't know how many people remember Farmer Greg. You know, Farmer Greg cartoons, right? And it was always raining cats and dogs. Right? It was always raining cats and dogs. I mean, cats and dogs were falling from the damn sky. And they'd fall, and they'd hit the ground, and they'd tumble over and run away. And that was the whole sequence. You know, if you're a little kid, you observe this. You know, boom, 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 boom. And so, you know, there, it's raining cats and dogs. It really was, you see. So that's, you know, like my imagery came from that. Because uh, there's a period when we didn't go out too much. They were, you know, plus we were poor and all that. So anyway, so I began writing from that perspective, you know, from, from Mickey Mouse. I said, I figured out that somebody wrote that for it to happen. Plus, you have to figure out that television was a new thing, you know, just like iPods are a new thing now. Televisions were a new thing then. And, you know, a lot of people didn't know how television worked. You know what I mean? Think about it. What is this? You bring in this big piece of furniture. You need moving men to bring it to your house, you know, right? And then they put it somewhere. Where do you want this, right? And then they plug it in the wall, and you turn it on, and the world enters your house. That was a new thing. I don't know, you guys. I mean, it was just 50 years ago, but it was new, you know. And so I didn't know how television worked, how the cartoons came through, you know what I mean? So they augment your imagination, you know, like in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, when they start imagining the ball game. you know what I'm saying? And um, so like that, yes. So kind of uh, surrealism via Mickey Mouse. That's the, that's yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's, it, the world was a lot limited when I was a kid than it is now. It's very expansive. Young, even young, like you know, kids nowadays. There's a picture of my granddaughter, you know, in in a Pampers on the computer. <laughs> You know, <laughs> this, this, you know, in a Pampers, on the computer, press the buttons, type the keyboard. You know what I mean? So, you know, we've advanced a lot as a species, you know. Uh, like, you know what I'm saying? It's back in the 50s, everything was very, very simple. That's why a lot of people want to go back there. Anyway, it was simple enough for me to be able to decipher certain things and put them in my reality so I could deal with them. Because we were immigrants. Another thing you got to realize, we were immigrants. I mean, I was born here. But my brother and my older sister were not. So everything coming here, but not, we were new. Everything was new to us. We had a like, uh, you know, Oscar Brown Jr. type of thing. Daddy, what's that there? You know, and 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 
you know, sometimes, well, Daddy wasn't there, so he couldn't answer the question. And then sometimes Daddy, even if he was there, didn't know what that was. You know, like, like immigrant kids now, you know, an, an immigrant family comes to New York, and after a while the sixth graders are telling the parents, you know, how the shit goes down here. You know, you know what I'm saying? Right? I mean, you, you mentioned the kind of the popular culture aspect, but I also think there's obviously a, a strong political dimension to, to that poem. And it's interesting because there's a, there's a great uh, recording I found of you doing that uh, with the El Grupo on the El Grupo LP. Do you remember mm -hmm. that, right? There's yeah. a, uh, so it's a, a, an LP called El Grupo. I think it's Songs of the Latin American Struggle or something like that. Uh, and in the, from 74. El Grupo was, was, was a group that, that I was in. It was a, a musical poetry troubadour type yeah. of group. Um, and we sang political songs, and, and and well, I didn't sing, you know. So Bernardo Palombo, right? Of, uh, Bernardo Palombo, Palombo yeah. Suni Paz, Santa Isia, Maria Tevez, right? Yeah. Montañez is uh, um, Sandra Maria Tevez, Americo Casiano, myself. Yeah. So we were like a troop. We were we were functioning with the socialist, the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. We'll erase that part of the thing. The Puerto, <laughs> Rican, the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. And we were like part of their cultural wing, and we would go out in the Cuchifrito Circuit, they called it, you know, where we'd go around to do these poetry readings and this musical protest music and everything. And it was really cool. It was a good experience. That was back in 73, um, 74, with Juan Maribras and all of that. And, uh, we didn't eat much. They didn't pay us. It was, you know, I found out that socialism sucks. <laughs> you know, that, that's what I found because we were always hungry. Hey, what the hell, you know? We were doing all these songs and these hitas and you know. Anyway, go ahead. Now, I think it's funny. It was good work, though. Yeah, we academics love to to compartmentalize, to put stuff into labels because that's how stuff gets taxonomized and put into university archives and collections. But in reality, you were kind of in a lot of different scenes and movements and spaces. That's the way poets are, right? You're you're, you're moving all the time. Nosy, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so people usually think, well, you have the young birds over here and the Neurican Poets Cafe over there, and then you had you know the the, the, the so socialist party over there, and that's true. But what's interesting about your work, it's more like that poem is that it worked in all these contexts, right? Uh, you, you were you were affiliated at various times with with the, with the various groups and various projects, uptown, downtown, with a Latin American focus, yeah. with an Afro Puerto Rican focus, with a you know so with a, a Bohemian side, but also kind of political side. So uh, well, I, I used to move around a lot. I don't know why. I just you know I just used to like doing things. I mean I still do. Um, but um, but see, okay, I think that what's important to know about that though, why, you know, okay, okay, there was me that I liked to hang out, but I wasn't the only one. It's like everybody liked to hang out in those days. And what was interesting was that, like, like for instance, I was last night, I was at the Boricua, um, hanging out with my buddies, uh, uh, Marcos and uh, Marco Dima and, and Fernando, um, Sally Krupp and Nisa Tufino, and um, we were hanging out there last night to go get, um, um, uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but anyway, it was an art exhibit that we had, and we all had contributed as poets and painters, so there was a painting and a poem that accompanied the painting, a beautiful show called Alma, which we did um, right before 9-11, and um, uh, we took the show to Puerto Rico and everything. So what happened is, is that there was the painter would do a painting and the poet. And and what happened there was that um, Rafael Tufino was was one of the painters and um, and the other artists. It's, it's a great great exhibit. Actually, it's up right now at the Boricua. So if you want to go see it, you should go over to Taller Boricua and see it. While instead of it's called the Alma Show, in addition with some Chicanos that are there too, which is all embodied in what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> but what I want to say say is that um, yesterday they, they gave us some of the prints and, and the print was from um, um, uh, uh, Defo, Rafael Tufino, and I was honored to receive the print that he had signed because Defo passed away a few years ago, so it's like really an honor to have this, this painting. Um, anyway, the thing is that it really kind of like when we were hanging out, it felt like the old days, you know what I mean? And, and Flaco Navaja was with, was with us, and the thing about it is he was the youngest dude there, but he was really grooving on it, you know, like he got it. 
right, right, right. He got it that this is how we used to hang out, and we talk about all kinds of crazy nonsense, you know. But also art and philosophy and what was going on. I mean, like I felt like in those days we were a lot closer, and there's a reason why we were a lot closer. I don't think it's my imagination or I'm nostalgically remembering something differently. We really were in touch with one another. We really were hanging out because our backs were really against the wall. All of us, collectively. There was no pretending that it wasn't. You see what I mean? So we were really, we were forced to be involved with one another in order to achieve certain things that have come to pass, that exist, and some of them that are fading away, some of them that are being gentrified, interloped, taken over, whatever the hell. But, but those things could not have happened unless we were behaving as a community like that. We were, we were transported. So you got to figure out, I wasn't born in Puerto Rico. You know, my connection to Puerto Rico was as limited as, as, or, or was as profound as I felt like it being. Because I didn't know anything about Puerto Rico, you know what I mean? My my family came here. They, you know, I was conceived over there and born over here. That's my bridge. You know what I mean? There, you know, there, you know, Pedro, my good friend. You know, he he climbed up a damn uh, palm tree. I never did that. You know, he had that. He he rode a horse along the beach. You know what I mean? I didn't have those kind of memories. You know, so think about it. I'm a little kid. You know, it's incumbent upon me to care if I go there to care. You see what I'm saying? But at those times in the 50s and the 60s, you really didn't have much of that choice. You see what I mean? Shit was happening. It was going down. You know, like Kent State. You know what I mean? The students that saw the 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 uh, uh, the Pickerton guards. Uh, oh, I'm I'm at the. Um, National Guard. <laughs> Shoot those students, then they became radicalized by that. You see what I'm saying? It's that like you can't avoid it. It was all over the place. Unlike now. See, I think that now people can 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 um, convolute themselves into believing that um, because certain achievement have been made in society, that they can just be absorbed by society. Como si now. You know, like that. But that's not true. It's never was true. It's not, you know, we're still in the farm. But I, so I think that that's why a lot happened in those days because we were really, you know, there was nothing for us, and unless we fought for it together, it wasn't going to happen. And I think everybody knew that on some kind of level, even if they weren't totally conscious of it. That's great. I mean, but it sounds like you you also had a kind of personal vocation as a poet really early on? I mean, because uh, you, you mentioned in the preface that uh, uh, Casting Long Shadow is your first book. Uh, came about uh, through like a high school uh, project. Is that, is, that, is, that, is that am I remembering that correctly? Which is pretty incredible to me. I, w- I would have been way too terrified as a high school senior, right, to uh, to think about uh, sell, you know, p- publishing uh, publishing a book. But you were already thinking at that young age in terms of uh, you know publishing. Of, well, I always uh, like uh, printing. I always okay. like printing. And and remember, this is a period when we're we're, we're transitioning from manual typewriters to electric typewriters. <laughs> And that, that's that's the new thing. Uh, IBM with the little element, the little ball. Everybody's all excited about that. Oh, look at that! Oh, the carriage doesn't move. <laughs> Hands-free carriage. <laughs> so, uh, in 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 um, I mean, in 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 that regard, um, it, it was a very. Um, I liked printing. I always liked printing. Even though I remember, I used to make potato. Things, you know, you cut out the potato and make letters. I, I, since I was a little kid, I just liked doing that and always make a mess. I'm, you know, I, I didn't like painting, but I liked printing. Um, but anyway, Morris High School, this is interesting. Morris High School had a print shop in the basement as their graphic art studio. Where you could this is in the Bronx, right? In the Bronx. You, Morris High School you, up there. You grew up Boston, here, but then you moved to the Bronx as a teenager, right? I grew up in yeah. Barrio, but when I was... Um, uh, 15, you know, when my dad died, then we moved to the Bronx, and uh, we were one of the first Puerto Rican families on Morris Avenue, mm-hmm. and 153rd, like that was like the frontier, you know, that was the south, talking about the, that was the south, south, south Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and Puerto Ricans are slowly, slowly moving up to Southview. That was the aim to get to Southview. You know? That was Nirvana. <laughs> that was an apartment with a sunken living room. <laughs> 
So I like printing, and what happened was they had this printing press. I mean, a real printing press, one of those, you know, Benjamin Franklin type dude things. You know, that you had to like ink with a with a thing, and then and then after you did all of that, you had to undo it. You know, that was part. You had to all do it in 45 minutes. You had to do this: ink the damn thing, do your printing, and then unink it. We were industrious. <laughs> you can't get a kid to do that now. You know what are you talking about, man? But anyway, <clears throat> and it was all letter press. You know, you had to take the letters, each letter, upside down and backward, put it on the California job key, you know, bang, then put it on the, on the big thing. You've seen that, you know, in, in uh, what's that movie? Uh, 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 the one about the ship going, going back. Um, La Amistad, right? The, right? And you see, you see that type of printing. It's that kind of printing, very, very old-fashioned. With the, uh, oh, it was a lot of fun, you know. But the graphic arts, in order to get an A in graphic arts, the graphic arts teacher just wanted you to do a business card. You had to print like 50 business cards, just your name, one line, your address, two and three lines, and then your phone number. Now, I protested. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't need a business card. <laughs> he said, why don't you need a business card? I said, because the most important thing on a business card is your phone number. And we don't have one. <laughs> you know, it was those kinds of things. You could not have a phone. Those days, not now. But we didn't have a phone. I said, so I don't need a business card. <laughs> Can I do a book? <laughs> and he said, oh, sure. He could do a book. So I did um, Casting Long Shadows. Had about 16 pages in it. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. And so what did you, I mean, because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of poets in that, at that time were inspired by new typewriters, new technology, uh, you know, um, um, Mimeo, right, uh, publications. Right, so, so, so. They, were making, they were making advances, <laughs> man, in, in how, to, how to reproduce stuff. You know, there was a, what was it, Mimeograph, Rexograph, you know, black paper, the, the blue, oh, I love the smell of Mimeograph in the morning. What? <laughs> Well, I want to ask you. In, in that sense, I mean, you, you've uh, you've developed kind of your own your own poetic compositional style, what you call cascadence. I want to give you a chance to talk about that because okay. that's a, that's a serious kind of poetry geek question. But I think we should uh, bring it up, and also because it's an incentive for you to buy the book and see how different the poetry is uh, when when read than when uh, than when performed, right? Which is a really kind of complex relationship there between. Uh, uh, the spoken word and, and, and the print text, and to talk about uh, cascadence and how uh, how that came about. Well, kind of what happened was is the first two books I actually printed myself. Yeah. The, at at Morris High School, I did the first the uh, Hey Yo, um, not Hey Yo, um, Casting on Shadows. But then I was actually in the Upper Brown program at at Fieldston School. And they, too, had a printing machine. Somehow I'm attracted to these things. They made out of lead, so I couldn't, you know, it wasn't a magnetic attraction. But <laughs> I would find these things. And uh, the thing about their machine is that it was a linotype machine, which was really cool. Uh, let me just take a moment to tell you what a linotype machine is, okay? In the olden days... <laughs> In the olden days, you had to pick each letter out by hand, and it was this big thing, like this 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 tray made out of wood, and 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 they would, all the letters were arranged in a certain way, you know, just like the typewriter, but not in that order. And you had to memorize it, so I did that. But then, when the linotype came, it had one of those trays too. But here's the difference: it was like inverted. Instead of the text, like instead of the type pushing out, it pushed in. Because this machine made a lead plate of the whole line, you see. And to achieve that, what you would do is you, you'd put the tray that you wanted with the font, you know, if it was italics or whatever. They didn't have all these fonts, okay, just two or three of them. But they'd put it up there. And then there was a, you stood in front of a big typewriter that looked like it was connected to an, a, a metal skeleton. And then somewhere in all of this, there was molten lead happening, okay? The thing had a boiler and everything, you know? And and the, and you pour in the, the lead in blocks and it would melt it. So then you're sitting there and you're typing, right? <laughs> you're, you're typing behind this 
toxic thing. Anyway, you, you're typing the letter and you type a whole line of text. And then you press like the return button, which was like a lever. And what it would do is it would take these letters and press them against this thing where the molten lead was and it would shoot out this bar with the line into a bucket of water. And like, tsh- <laughs> and you just keep typing away and doing it. Then when you finish typing, you'd go in there in the bucket, take out all the lead, dry it, and then try to rearrange it in the order that the lines are supposed to be because after a while they got out of order. You know what I mean? And then that you would put on the block and put on the machine and do. Now in both those cases, if you experience those books, I have one right here. This is this is have you seen liberation, which was done like that. And, and, and you can see, you can actually feel the type. Right? You can feel the type on it. So, you know, you can't that anymore. <laughs> but there, you can. So yeah, sure beats what we have today, right? Sure beats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy word processing, yeah. <laughs> so, to answer your question, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, when computers came out, what I discovered was that... Uh, I had been experimenting with cascadence and I was having trouble because the page just wasn't wide enough for me. You know, sometimes I would turn the page over and write on the landscape because the poem wanted to move out. You know what I mean? Come, it wanted to get wider this way. And so I was bumping into the end of the page because there were only 66 type spaces on a typewriter. So then when the computer came out, I got, you know, I saw a Mac and I saw that you could type virtually, mm-hmm. and that it was using uh, uh, what, what's called proportional spacing, so an I will take up only the space that it needs, and a W will take up as much space as it needs. You see? Um, that gave me more room on the page, you know, to go across, you know? And so I started writing like that, you know? That, that's what created, you know, that's what helped me with my cascadence. Plus, you didn't have to keep typing the same damn poem over and over again. <laughs> you know, you could just type it once, change it, reprint it, you know. And I, I used to type the whole poem over. If you look in my archives, you'll see that there's several poems that have been retyped over and over and over again. It's really impressive. That's a hot outline. Yeah. I have trouble typing notes now. <laughs> okay. That's funny. Sorry. So I want to ask you a question about uh, the kind of uh, give, give folks a sense of chronology about the street poetry uh, book because you mentioned that as a kind of uh, transition book from that early style of the first two books, right? To I think you call it something like a kind of a New Yorkian but also kind of Bohemian awakening in in, in your work. And so I thought that, I, I thought that was something worth discussing, right? How, how does that work maybe shift from the very early stuff that you were doing in Casting Long Shadows and and Have You Seen Liberation? Okay, interesting. Good question. What happened was the first two books, it was me doing it by myself. Yeah. So um, I, I, I looked for poems that were like easy for me to typeset. Um, and, um, you know, that I could do it. You know, so I don't know how you get this energy from. You get an idea, you just do it. It's so liberating. Um, now we must give us pause. But... Um, but I just went ahead and did these things, so that was easy. But when, when we did um, um, Street Poetry, that this, this is a beat up. Actually, I've had this book all the while. Since 1972, I've had this book with me. That's why it's all beat up like that. Um, then the publisher got involved, and they had an editor, and they were like, no, not this poem. They didn't want me to get, see, their perspective was that they wanted the book to sell. So they didn't want those Attica poems in there, you know what I mean? They didn't want all those. I handed them a manuscript that was a little bit bigger than, than what they published. You know, they chopped throughout a lot of poems and blah, blah. But then when you think about it, this book came out in 1972. It's hardcover. This is a hard damn co- It never came out of paperback. This is a hardcover. Okay? And it was $4.95. It was the price of a nickel bag of smoke. <laughs> Just, you know, economically speaking. But, <laughs> but you know, it, to me that's really cheap, you know, <laughs> $5, you know, for a hardcover book. I'll be, you mentioned in the context of a kind of New Yorkian 
awakening or a bohemian awakening? Was that, is that in terms of the, the, the poetry, in terms of actually meeting poets? Because you also talk in the preface about meeting uh, you know, the various poets, including Pietri, and, and also about a kind of bohemian right, uh, sensibility right, in, in your work at, at the time. So. Well, you know, like, uh, I never thought that, like, about, I never thought myself about being a poet. You know, I never thought in those terms until later on. Hmm. Okay? Then that became important after I started, you're right, after I started hanging out with the poets and, and learned that there were like more of me's around, you know? <laughs> because I was in my own vacuum, you know what I mean? There was, this is all prior to the New Yorican poets movement. There was no damn me. You know what I mean? I was just writing in my little fire escape in the bedroom, lo que sea, you know what I mean? I didn't know about other people. And, and so it wasn't until, you know, well, the way I started reading was that my friends, that we all used to go to Fieldston and we used to read poetry on the, on the quadrangle, you know, we just just sit there in the grass and read poetry and, and we all had beads and shit, you know, and sandals and long hair and, you know, and guitars, you know, I wanted me, not ever, but my friends had guitars, it was all of that, just think of that, you know, we were like that. And so, we were up in Fieldston and so... In the grass, I'd sit down and I'd read my poem. I had a contest with another guy, Royce, I remember, over who could write the most poems over the summer. You know, we'd be competing with each other, writing, I wrote a new poem, that's 12, how many you got? I got 13, are you? I had a stupid little contest like that, but he was a good writer. I don't know what became of him, but um, anyway, um, so we, we would read to one another. Then one day, one of the guys said, you know, Bob uh we're going to hit... Uh, uh, in this club on 96th Street called the Inner Sunset. I remember the Inner Sunset on 96th Street between Broadway and Columbus or something. And he said, why don't you come on down and read some of your poetry? Now, I had never read my poetry to an audience, really. We used to do doo-wops and, uh, uh, you know, pantomime songs, like you pretend you're the Temptations and shit, you know, and stuff like that. And we get on stage and we'd have talent shows, and that's what we do, right? And there's a picture of, of it in the book. Um, but I wouldn't get up on stage and read my poetry to my fellow students. You see what I'm saying? So, so my friend said, no, we're going to go hit at this club. And he was like, so anyway, I remember that night because I went home, and I was laying down in the bed. It was like, you know, twilight, you know, and stuff like that. And I was trying to take a nap, but something would not let me sleep. It just gets, like, it kept bugging me, like if you're sleeping on a bed with, with ants on it or something. You know what I mean? It's like, just wouldn't I roll over and roll over? I said, I just want to take a nap, just 15 minutes. And this thing would not let me, and I said, okay, okay, I'm going to the damn thing. So I got up and I went to the thing, you know. <laughs> And uh, when, I, when I showed up, the band was playing with its back to the audience. I thought that was weird. You know, it was like, oh, I should go home. You know? <laughs> and, and so it was just a weird place. And then everybody was eating, and it was a lot of noise. It was like a cafeteria, you know. Anyway, they recognized me, my, my friends, and they said, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. So they got me up on stage and I started reading my poetry and, and I was having a miserable time reading my poetry because it was all this chatter going on, you know? And I, I, I couldn't, like, I said, these fucking people ain't even listening to this thing, you know? I'm <laughs> reading these poems. So then I came across, I said to myself, I've had it. I'm, I'm getting out of here, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the wops. Um, so I said, I'm going to read one more damn poem and I'm going to get the hell out of the stage and that's the end of that. And I turned, I had this little book. There were two little books that I had all my poetry in at the time. And I opened it up, and I turned to this poem, which I had just written, re, re, written recently called Message to Urban Sightseers. Oh, yeah. And I said to myself, and see now, in Did you sight, do that for us? Did you do that for us? Okay, okay. In Sightseers, I had experimented. Ta -da -da -da. <laughs> I had experimented with, with, with the typewriter. You know, I found that the typewriter could do other stuff, you know, besides just type letters. So I, 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 I was experimenting with using capital letters to say something more, you know. <laughs> so here I am pissed off at the audience without paying any attention to me while I'm doing, pouring my heart out to them. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to read this damn poem and I'm going to get the hell out of here. But what happened was, after I read the poem, you could hear a damn pin drop in the room. It was like totally damn quiet. 
And I said, uh oh, what happened? <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden they all jumped up to their feet and they started applauding like crazy. <laughs> I like, oh shit. And I said, okay, I think this is what I'm going to keep doing. So, anyway, here's sights here. Okay. You're reading Spanish? Uh, it's a little long. I'm not going to read both versions. Okay, well, you, we can read some of it then. I'll, I'll do a taste uh, of it after you read it. Yeah, I want to talk about the book a little bit in the translation. Well, process. This, will be the last, this will be the last. We can do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, you! Oh, wow, that's easy. Before I start. Okay. So, so, I'm pissed off at the audience and I open the book and I see the poem. And of course, the words, hey, yo, hey, you shoot out at me, you know, like that, because they're capitalized, you know, for the first time in any of my poems. And I go, oh. <laughs> so they shoot out, they just, hey, you, sightseer from small town, nowhere, U.S. of A., bring your head down, your eyes off those tall business buildings. Look here, sightseer, sightsee, I'm a sight, a sight to be seen by your sore eyes. Sure, I'll be your guide. Want to send a friend a picture postcard? Here, take this one. That's me, my brothers, my mother, my father, my aunt, my uncle, my sisters, our cousins, and our dog. We all live very near one another. The same apartment. Oh, you think it's cute the way my youngest brother sits on our dog? We don't, actually. He thinks Rover is a horse. No, no kidding. He really thinks Rover is a horse. He wants to be a cowboy. I think he'll be a soldier riding horseback on some tank. Do you really like the family pose? It was taken on our fire escape. It collapsed just as we all entered the house. Nobody heard, but since last summer, the people across the street have had the ugly view of our apartment. That their wall is our wall to wall nothingness. Last winter, when it snowed, all the kids from the neighborhood came into my house and we skied in my living room. Come on, sightseer, I'll take you to my house. You can sit in the living room with your feet in my bedroom and the elbow in the kitchen. Come dinner time, we all can gather around the table, the floor, the beds, the fire escape, the hall, the toilet, the bathtub, and eat our food. If we run out of plates, we'll use the dog's bowl, the ashtrays, the rat's poison dish, the possum pan, small corners on the table in our hands to cup our share of 137 cents can of spaghetti divided by family. Come on, Sicea, don't be a fool. Take advantage of my hospitality. Oh, don't leave. I ain't tell you about me doing homework while roaches gather around to get the education. Kind of makes me feel like Dr. Doolittle. And when we flood the sewers, turn on the hydrants and make like Jones Beach while junkies taking people off so they can get their daily fed. Hey, you sightseer from small town, nowhere, U.S. of A., bring your head down, your eyes off those tall business buildings. Look at here, sightseer, sightsee, I'm a sight, a sight to be seen by your sore eyes, by the eyes of the OEO, by the eyes of the world, by the eyes of the stars and moon. Look at here, look, look, God damn it, I'm interested. I, I was 17 when I wrote Sicy. I remember that. The summer of 17. Wow. It's amazing because I, th I, I think of the, there's these poems in uh, Willie Perdomo Smoking Lovely. Well, he, just, he describes the gentrification of, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of El Barrio, right? Uh, and you can see him kind of shouting at the tourists that come by to take uh, <laughs> pictures, right, of the slam poet in his native environment, right? right. You can totally see Willie reading you, right? You can tell that he's been reading you, right, and reading the, that, that kind of way in which the barrio is defined from the inside, but also from the outside, right, for, for, from the tourists that tries to tell the person in the barrio who they are and what their life is about. So the kind of uh, really powerful sense of class, right, and also of of political resistance, I think, then for, for some for a poet so young, and you can see kind of younger poets uh, like like Willie, uh, you know, riffing off of that in, in their work. Mm. So uh, I also want to ask you. I mean, there's a, there's a whole uh, meditation on like visibility in your early work, right? Think of all the titles. Have you seen liberation? Casting uh, long shadows, right? Message for urban sightseers, <laughs> right? It's like seeing, seeing and, and not being seen, right? And I think about that in the context of Puerto Ricans in the 60s and 70s who were either invisible, right? Uh, invisible in the, 
in the mass media or else visible in the wrong way. It's visible as, you know, you know, West Side Story, right, or right. Oscar Lewis's yeah. La Vida, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so it seems that there's a kind of very, very sophisticated uh, rethinking of what it means to be visible or invisible, right, as a Puerto Rican in the 60s and 70s, right? And I don't know if you thought about it, but no, I definitely no. pick up on it when I'm writing about Of course I think about that. that. <laughs> you know, my, my thing, okay. My, my. Oh, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, I grew up a Puerto Rican in a barrio, but my main hangout buddies were black. That's important. I talk about that in, in, in the preface. Yeah. The guys that I hung out with were the African Americans that I met when I walked out into the hallway, you know, Snooky and Boba Benji and those guys, you know, and, and, and my neighbors, now check this out, the, I, I live in the apartment that I grew up in as a kid in El Barrio on 11th Street. Um, it's a lot smaller than I remember. <laughs> there are a few walls I'd like to take down. <laughs> but but um, in that apartment, a lot happened. My next door neighbor, immediately next door to me, was Blasina and her children. One of her kids was Andy Torres, who was the first Puerto Rican to dance for Alvin Ailey. Hmm. I remember sitting down in Brasina's living room when when uh, when Andy was going to be on the Ed Sullivan show, <laughs> and we all sat in front of the black and white television waiting for Andy to you know fly across the screen, which he did. You know, and we went crazy again. There's that little box. We don't know how this happens, but there's Andy <laughs> shooting across the screen. <laughs> And, and they were black, you know, like uh, Blasina was, you know, one of the black Puerto Ricans. And then everybody else in the building, our building was like real, like the United Nations had everybody, Jews, Italians, Irish, Puerto Ricans, you know, blacks. It was really a nice mix. But most of my friends were black. And the thing about my black friends is my black friends taught me English. They taught me how to speak English. They taught me how to write. You know, our chalkboard was the walls of the hallway, you know, where, where I learned how to write. See, I didn't know that dick was a bad word, right? So then, you know, my friends, you know, taught, taught me that dick was a bad word, you know, that what it meant. So then I wondered about Dick Tracy. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> and so forth, you know, that's how I got my spelling lessons. Uh, yeah. Cool. I'm, I'm sorry. So, 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 we talk about the book then? Think, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. I guess my first question would be how did this book come about? Man, thank you very much for asking that. Okay, first. My good friend, Gabrielle David, who I cannot give enough props to, Gabrielle David, uh, for who publishes Fatitude, Fatitude magazine, and it's always been um, the brain child of, of she and her organization, the Intercultural Alliance of Artists and Scholars Incorporated. It's just a, 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 an organization, a not-for-profit of, of just people that believe in in the interculturalism of, of, of the arts and, and, the, and its scholarly uh, worth, and therefore just trying to put out products and, and understanding and information on that tip. You know, just that, that you know, because a lot of times we don't see ourselves as scholars and intellectuals, you know? And, and I do consider myself an intellectual because, you know, I've been in trouble with the police enough time for them to know the difference. So, <laughs> no, criminal, no, intellectual, yes, okay. <laughs> so, but, um, so, we, you know, the, um, the, um, Intercultural Alliance of, of Artists and Scholars, which puts out Fatitude Magazine, one of their dreams was to do a publishing press to publish books. Now, for a long time, I've been asking Puerto Ricans to do this, you know, like, because cause the, the Chicanos got the uh, Alte Publico and so forth, who published, they published Tato and, you know, they published Puerto Ricans, good for them. But, you know, I would say, we need our thing, you know what I mean, or anything, because because when these books were published, it was hard to get published. Now it's not as hard to get published if you're going to go, you know, and do things online. But it's still hard to find a publisher, right? It's mm -hmm. still hard to find a publisher if you're looking for a publisher. You could publish yourself, you know, but to find a Anyway, so Gabrielle saw this book when I first came to New York in 1994 after living in California for like 20 years. Gabrielle saw um, street poetry and other poems one time when she was in my house and her comment at that time, this is about 15 years ago, 
And she said, um, you know, these books are still, these poems are still uh, relevant today. That was her comment. And she said, um, it'd be nice to, to reprint this book. Have you ever thought about reprinting it? And I said, well, you know, its 30th anniversary is coming up pretty soon. Um, that'd be a nice time to do it. But, you know, we, we didn't do it. So then she said, uh, um, uh, then, you know, time moved on and its 40th anniversary was, was approaching. And now I'm pissed off with myself because, yes, I wanted to print the 30th anniversary. That's what people do, you know. And <coughs> so Gabrielle, <coughs> who had been publishing me in fatitude in, in practically every issue because she likes my poetry, she likes my contemporary poetry, and these poems, like I said, are over 40 years old. So she liked these, and she said, let's, let's start doing it. So we started in April of last year. In April of last year, we started to put together. Wow, that's really quick. And even all those translations? That's yeah, like, yeah, wow. right, right. We're not in April of this year. <laughs> <laughs> so it was April of last year, and, and I, I gave her the manuscript. You know, I, we, we, we searched high and low to find the original Cassie Long Shadows. Nobody had one. You know, now somebody called me from Chicago and told me they have one somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, I tried to read, you know, this book, uh, uh, um, Street Poetry, and then the other one, um, Have You Seen Liberation? I thought it was on the table. Are you? Oh, oh, here it is. Oh, I, yeah. I, 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 I have you seen Liberation? You know, these two books. So what happened is, I told Gabrielle, well, why don't we put all three of them together and make one book with all three of them and celebrate their birthday together? But she liked that. So that's what we were. But then she started, uh, she started working on the magazine, uh, which was going to be a bilingual issue. And she needed some translators. And she got translators from Hunter College. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. She got some students from Hunter College, and um, uh, they decided to, uh, they were translating the magazine into Spanish, and then Gabriel asked me, would I be interested in, in translating the poems um, for, the, for our book? And I said, oh, that, that sounds very interesting. Let's do that. <laughs> So we got on that tip. As soon as they finished that, the translators, I got to say, uh, uh, they're Adam Weir. Adam is from, where's Adam from? Oklahoma or something. And um, uh, um, Carolina Fung Feng, who's from Costa Rica, but her family is Chinese. But she grew up in Costa Rica. And Marjorie Gonzalez, who's Chilena. And these three people got together to translate the poems. We met once a week um, for about six weeks right here at Hunter College in the lobby downstairs. And um, I just gave, I just signed the copy to um, Angel, who's one of the custodians who works here, because he saw us work on this book all that time. And so he just asked me about it when I came in. And I said, oh, yeah, this is what it is, you know. So I gave him a copy. Um, but you buy a copy. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, what I like about the translation, the translations, they went through a lot, okay, because it wasn't just these three translators. Um, I could say some controversial stuff, but I'll let you ask the question. Um, <laughs> um, no, the translator is not Puerto Rican. Um, I wrote the book for Puerto Ricans. All these books I wrote for Puerto Ricans. I wrote them in English for Puerto Ricans. So our translation needed to be global. It needed to be something if you're sitting on Machu Picchu. If, if you're sitting on a throne in Machu Picchu. And you have other paper. <laughs> but you have a copy of my book. <laughs> You will be able to read the book and understand what's going on. We tried very hard not to have any any uh, uh, footnotes in the book. And there's only one footnote in the whole damn book. And it's a good one. <laughs> it's a really, really good one. I'm not even going to tell you. Okay, I'll tell you what poem it's in. <laughs> it's in a poem called uh, Walking and Thinking Within a Chaotic Revolution Within Life. 
Um, in that poem, you'll find the only footnote in the whole book, and it's really a good one. Really good one. Because we couldn't. For weeks and weeks and weeks, we argued over it, you know? Like, no, it's got to be this way, no, it's got to be that way. Um, and we, we couldn't come up with anything, so finally we just had to leave it alone, so we needed to footnote it, but, it, but it's a good one. Um, the other challenge was niggas and negros. There's a poem called Prologue to Understanding. I'll share this with you. And I'd like to share an intimate thing with you too right now. I'm going to take the opportunity to share this with you. Um, uh, there's a poem, Prologue to Understanding, in the book. And our problem was is that in Prologue to Understandings, which is a 70s poem, where, you know, we could call, you know, we could call the kettle black and all that, and now we have to be politically co correct about things that we're doing. We were just finding things. So we needed... To, the poem distinguishes between niggers, Negroes, and black people from a Puerto Rican perspective, from, from my perspective as a kid. So we needed to delineate that, to make that, then that was really difficult. We couldn't just say negro, 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 you see. So that's when we came up with um, negro desgraciados, negro domesticado, y el pueblo negro. So when you encounter that poem, I wow. thought that was really creative uh, translating to get exactly what we wanted to do. Wow. You know. Also, there's no translation for the word stickball. <laughs> okay, so we have to invent that one too, which hopefully will be on the lexicon of translation. It's uh, baseball callejero. <laughs> It's interesting you mentioned translating race, and I'll just tell you a, a story. I've been writing about William Carlos Williams' translations of Latin American poets, and one poet he translates is Luis Pales Matos, our great Puerto Rican quote-unquote national poet, his uh, Negrista poetry, right, his Afro-Puerto Rican poetry, and he has to make those kinds of calls. How do I translate Negro in Palos uh, poetry? Right, and it becomes right. this huge political thing, right. and I'm not sure how uh, comfortable Williams was going there, so he kind of goes there and doesn't, but it seems like that's going to be, a, you know, that's one thing that I value about what you're doing here, is that in translating we work into there. Spanish, well, you're also politicizing all those questions again. What does it mean to use those terms, right? What does it mean to, to uh, think about those terms? in a Puerto Rican sp a specific Spanish, but also what you're calling a, gl a global Spanish, right? So in that yeah, sense, translation is political, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. It, is, it is, yeah, we have to make a, a political choice. But I want to tell you a funny story before I keep telling you the, the rest of this. I, I just want to share this with you. I go to visit Tato La Viera in the hospital, right, the poet, who is in some state of semi-consciousness, right? And... Um, when I go to visit him, he's there with his sister and, and some other people. And they're showing you know, him a book that, that, that's on his work, uh, um, that some scholars are commenting on his work. So uh, finally it you know, comes around to me talking about my book. And they say, no, no, hablale, hablale a Tato porque te puedo oír, right? You know, talk to him because he can hear you, right? So I'm like, oh, Tato, look, man, this is my new book. And I lay it on his chest, you know. <laughs> It weighs a pound and a quarter. I put it on his chest, right? And uh, and I'm thumbing through it and trying to show him the pictures and everything. So then we get to talking about the translations for neg uh, uh, negro, nigger, and negro. Then all hell breaks loose in the hospital room. Tata's trashing about, and it's, we're all in a panic, and they're trying to calm him down, you know, and, 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 the, and the, the machinery's going, beep, 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 and there's all this madness, craziness going on, right? And no, Papa, and it's just saying, no, Tato, he's trying to say something, he wants to speak, but we can't let him because he's got all these tubes and they're holding him down. It's real, real high drama. I've been through this before. But <laughs> really high drama. So finally we calm Tato down, the nurse comes. So, you know, I'm going home, I'm walking down the street, and I'm thinking about it. And I said, fucking Tato. He was laughing, goddammit, at the translations of nigga and Negro. <laughs> he had busted out laughing. Uncle <laughs> Trump. 
Uh, well, I mean, then, what was the process of working with the translators like? Because as you mentioned, there are aspects to, to your poetry that are untranslatable, at least conventionally, right? The, the whole visual element, how do you render that if the, if, if the size of the text changes and it's not the same visual effect? Well, Alliteration, right? Poetic techniques, right? There's puns and wordplay in, in some of your poems that really can't be translated. So did you work together? Did you have like a... No, I'm glad, I'm glad you're bringing all of this up because it's a perfect moment. <laughs> because, um, like I said, you know, uh, to me, the book is really uh, Gabriel David's uh, uh, what do you call that uh, dream. This is this is what she put together, and she worked. With, it, it, this would not have happened without Gabriel's insight on how to put a book together. You know the vision of what of what this book could be because I didn't see it. You know, for for me it was like, okay, we're gonna do the, the, the anniversary of this book. Okay, let's put the three together. Okay, fine. And she came up with the translators, like I told you earlier. So all of this thing became to like come together. You know what I mean? But it was, you know, like I, I was just helping. You know, to be honest with you, I hadn't visited these poems in many years. You know, these are not the poems that I normally read when I go read in public. You know, now I'm reading from them because this book kind of like re reignited my own interest in my past poems. I began to see their profundity. You know, and I said these things they're pretty, they're pretty hot, they're they're pretty fun. You know, and they're fun. It was a different kind of pop poem, more freedom. You know, I felt like because I didn't really. You know, where now I think I know what I'm doing, then I didn't, you know, I knew I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you have more freedom, you know, you're just experimenting and doing things, but always trying to express yourself and trying to get, you know, I mean, I guess there was some talent there, you know, but, but I'm just really just experimenting and, and that's when I'm playing with the words. And, you know, I always say the poem that you write will lead you to the next one that you're going to write. You know what I mean? That's why you keep writing. You write one, and if you, you know, if you write one poem and stop, you're not necessarily going to write another one, maybe years later. Um, but, but one poem leads you to another. This is an augmentation of your intelligence from one to the other. Anyway, I want to give the, the props to these people while we're, while we're here at this. You know, like I said, Gabriel, David, and and um, and Kevin, uh, Kevin uh, Tovar Pesantes was was the other co-editor. And anyway, it, it just took I, I just I can't say it just took a lot of work to put this together, and just it's not been a year. You know what I mean? It's 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 really incredible. Anyway, and Shaggy Flores wrote the um, the afterward. Sandra Maria Tevez wrote the intro and. Um, uh, uh, Carmen Pietri and, and Sam Diaz, they write, uh, uh, what, what is it, the foreword for the book. So the book is like really, really complete. It has a table of content, has an index, it begins with a, a prologue poem, it has an epilogue poem, which have their own chapters, you know. I'll tell you right now, the youngest poem in the, in the book was written four years ago. It, it's the poem that ends the book called um, In a Grain of Sand. I uh, was inspired by watching some outer space movie, and then I remembered um, uh, Auguries of Innocence by Blake, where he says to see the world in a grain of sand, and so that kind of like all made sense. I love poetry, you know. Poetry is not always easy to write, but I love it. The way this shit just comes together, and you know, this and that, and you know, um, like okay, in that particular poem, um, I could have said in the curve of a helix at the end of the poem. But I wanted to create the helix itself. So I said in a helix's curve, I put an apostrophe between the, the X in helix and the S that, that, that's the apostrophe because it's harder to pronounce, right? Helixes, it's harder to pronounce than in the curve of a helix, you see? So by making it difficult to pronounce, to me, that's the helix. I don't know. I, I live alone. <laughs> anyway, so I can't give these people enough props. Gabrielle's back there, and she deserves a bunch of our applause. Can we do that, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much, Gabrielle. And um, I guess I mean, a couple of more questions, and we can we can open it up. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if you're planning on translating any more of your work. For, for, for example, I know that uh, that you did. 
uh, you do also you do also theater, and, and you, you know, in between this and you know uh, concertos on Market Street, you have broadsides, you have theater, you have other works, and have you ever thought of of uh, you know expanding this edition to include other work or doing <laughs> a second <laughs> volume or you know the uh, I don't know if Sam Brown wants to do another <laughs> another <laughs> translation book. I don't know, but we'll see. Um, no, I'm working on a book of love poems. Hmm. That should be nice in Spanish. Um, the problems that they had, the translators had, is that I write colloquially. You see, um, I didn't know that, you know? It's like somebody told me that my problem is I think I'm low maintenance. But I, I didn't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, um, if, you know, like the translators had a lot to grapple with. You got to give it to them. They, they, um, and, and they had overseers too. They had people that they would confer with as well. And, and, and everything was over my head because I don't write or read in Spanish. You know, I read very minimally. You know, Spanish is not my language. It's not my forte. If anybody has a problem with that, with them, is one conquistador language versus another, okay? We're not talking out of here, you know? So don't get on my case, you know? Um, but, so, so, but, but nevertheless, you know, what I like about the Spanish translations, I really need to share this with you, is this. I write in English, or in this colloquialism, right? And I write about the things I see, and you guys, too, who write, right? We all write... And then we read these things to each other, and we're there, we're blown away. Wow, yeah, that was a really good poem, blah, blah, blah. Now, let me tell you what happened when you translate them into Spanish. They become absurd, right? Don't they? They get, like, on the ridiculous tip. Now they're surreal. They're, they're far more. If they were surreal before, they're off the page now. You know what I mean? Super Puerto police. <laughs> it's, like, funny, man, you know? <laughs> So, but the, so then I started thinking about this socially, you know, like what the hell does that mean, really? And it, it has a profound, uh, a, a profound meaning. This is what I think, okay? This shows how jaded we are about our reality. Because in English, we can accept these things, you know? Like, like you know, uh, two piles of shit sitting in the gutter, one trying to stink more than the other. I'm dumb, niggas. Okay? It, <laughs> Plain in Spanish, that's hilarious, you know. <laughs> or crazy, right? You know, yeah, it's like what, what, what? So to me, it's like we accept our reality. You know how, for however absurd it is, poverty, cockroaches, junkies, you know, everything, right? We accept that reality so readily. But then, for the Spanish-speaking world, right? It panorante, right? <laughs> For those guys, you know, when I read, they read this, they go, "How could these people live like this?" <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> what are you thinking? I thinking uh, on that note, uh, are you thinking of touring with this book in the Spanish-speaking world and and take? Cause it seems like it would be really uh, helpful, precisely because there is that ignorance about right. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope it opens up those kinds about of your doors. work about the Near Eastern poetry tradition, about uh, you know Puerto Rican literature in the U.S. Right, and so these things are important. Yeah. Those are very. First of all, one of the things I want to do is try is try to get the book to to, to Cuba, to uh, to the tobacco uh, the, the, the 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 tobacco the cigar making factories because they read to their workers. So I just thought, you know, why not read this in Spanish? <laughs> it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Cigar production fell this week. Because <laughs> the workers could not stop laughing. <laughs> That's a plight of Puerto Ricans in New York. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's that, and like I said, Machu Picchu. I, I think, <laughs> I think. Um, okay, I said earlier that uh, you know our backs were up against the wall, like as a people, culture, and all that, and that's why we achieved a lot of the things and institutions. Even the reason why we're in this very room, you know, right? Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, there was a time when, oh, Papa came out with a new book, let's have a, then nobody can have a forum, ain't nobody gonna talk about that, you know what I mean? We've come a long way, baby, regarding that. Um, and so, um, 
now I see that we're more splintered. A friend of ours says we are we're broken. Not broken and like defeated, but like broken in like a, a vase is cracked or something. And that we really are that that unified and, and we're you know, we're not really functioning, you know, one for all and all for one. It's like, you know, me for me and I for I and and so and you hear it a lot and, and that's what I hear, you know, in a lot of writing that that's not being called writing to be called something else, you know. Um but a lot of it is about I, I, I. Well, like, these poems are not necessarily about me. You know, I'm like the observer kind of guy, you know, in the midst of things. Uh, but what Adam called it, uh, uh, called the book uh, A Lotus in Mud. I love that. A <laughs> Lotus in Mud. Um, you know, so yeah, you know, like I'm the frog in the dam, you know, <laughs> looking out, looking at shit, and writing about it. But it's not about me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's about the things that I see, which I think is what poetry is supposed to be about. Poetry is supposed to be about empathy, about feeling for other, putting yourself in someone else's situation. That's why they're great war poems, uh, poems about poverty. You know, that's why they're great poems, because they affect... To me, the best compliment somebody can get about a poem is, I felt like that, too. You know, that, to me, is the compliment. Just like teachers look for the, the shine, the little gleam in the kid's eye when they get it, you know, and that's the teacher's reward b beside the salary, you know what I mean? But that's the reward, that little gleam. They'll tell you anybody. And then always people will tell you, well, if it wasn't for poetry, I'd be dead. You know, those, these are true things because they're, 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 you know, as real as this table, you know? So, um, you know, I... I I just hope people read my book, buy my book, invite me to talk, you know, because I want to talk. I got a lot to say. I'm a smart guy. You know, I got great <laughs> stories. And um, and it, it's all about compassion, you know. Thank you very much, everybody, you know. And thank you, Gabrielle. Thank, you know, and thank um, uh, David Gonzalez that wrote the article for me in the New York Times, which, you know, helped me. Uh, get out of a bad situation, you know, because because you know you put a book together and the book's not gonna rescue you, you know what I mean? It's not gonna like you know it doesn't come with a cape. It got feet but no cape, so you know the book will precede you, but it'll get there walking, you know. Um, so you know, it's just I was reading something today in in, in where somewhere you know it's just that. Uh, the, the world is very fractured right now, and people are very, very, uh, and it's getting worse, you know? So, so the thing is, we just need to help each other, hang out, and, and communicate. Like, like, I really liked being with Flacco last night, you know, because, like, he was, like, hanging out with the, with the old artist, you know, and he was digging it, you know what I mean? It was, like, far fucking out. He was, like, blown away, you know? What's well, a beautiful thing about this book also is you'll see how many great poets and, and writers from across generations are giving love to Pablo's work, right? In that sense, you're a kind of link, right, between the, the foundational poets and people coming up now, and, you, and uh, that's an important part, I think, of, of what's here, not just the poetry itself. Yeah, like, think about the it. The resonances of the poetry, right? When, yeah. when, when, when Ginsburg would drop by the New Yorkian, right? Yeah. Now, Ginsburg, you know, Ginsburg's not Puerto Rican. He's an honorary New Yorkian, but, you know, <laughs> Uh, we were excited to have him over, you know, to hang out with him and, and so forth, you know. Um, you know, I, I met Richard Davidson one time. That was great. He wrote Moon Over McDougal Street. When I was born and born I was into life as secure as a rug. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's this guy proper? Um, you know, it's, it's Janine Vega. You know, there's a lot of great poets. I, I like being called a poet. I don't like being called a spoken word artist and stuff like that. Because, see, here's another thing, is that when we were writing, when we were writing back in the... Like, all of us are writing by ourselves, and then we kind of found each other. But the thing about it is that when we were all writing, we were always trying to be writers. We were trying to be poets. That was the aspiration. To be one of those guys, and you know, the, the funny looking guys in the textbooks. We wanted to be, we didn't want to be in the textbooks, but we wanted to be those kind of guys, you know? And um, 
you know, we didn't want to be rock stars and, you know, nothing like that. I mean, that was its own rock stardom in a sense. But well, it wasn't that note, can I ask you, was rock star, do we have to do one, one uh, going out uh, going okay. out poem then? Wanna yeah. pick something Are we going to do a QA or do we not uh, have time? What, what, how are we doing on time? Can we do a... So, oh, okay, okay, so can you so do a poem we'll then and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, okay? So, okay, what poem, do you have a poem in mind? Uh, I don't know, well, maybe you want to do the, the last poem because it's the most recent one maybe? Or, or it's okay, up to you. it's up to different you. than all, okay, yeah, that poem, of course, is, okay, we can do that, in a grain of sand. Yeah. yeah. Um, like again, you know, Gabrielle and I discussed a lot of things about the book, and um, Shaggy said, "Oh no, the poem got to start with a bang. We need a poem that, you know, really." And Heyo was at the back of the book, so we moved Heyo to the front of the book because he wanted to take another poem that out of context. I didn't want that to happen, so we put Heyo in the front so the book could begin with a bang, and then. Um, it kind of like felt to me a little bit uneven. I said, now we need a poem for the back, <laughs> you know, to, to end the sandwich, you know. And um, Gabriel, let me put this one in here. So, so one other thing. Hey, Yo was written 20 years ago, the poem. And this poem was written in 2010. Then all the other poems were written before 1972. Okay. Better? Okay. Okay, so what do you want me to read in a grain of sand? You gonna read it in Spanish? If you want, sure. Okay, I'll read it. Okay. In a grain of sand. We are star seeds, every one of us. You and me, and me and you, and him and her, and them and they, and those who know of this are truly blessed. True for all living beings. Beings, living, not humans only, but ants and trees and the open breeze, things that breathe, air or fire, water, earth, all kinds of dust and dirt, particles, a part of all, all, a part of everything that is in everything. Thus it sings and its song is life and life is a seed of stars, the dust of suns and moons, rocks and dust and outer smoke and outer space floating in a bath of timelessness, counted, measured, numbered by some species, others caring not, science and mathematics trying to plot, poetry in motion, motion in a helix's curve, and life on earth becomes visible to you through the naked eye. En un grano de arena. Somos semillas estelares, cada uno de nosotros, tú y yo y yo y tú y él y ella y estos y esos y aquellos. Los que saben eso son en verdad benditos. Verídico para todos los seres vivos, los seres vivientes, no solo humanos, sino hormigas y árboles y el aire libre. Ellos que respiran aire o fuego, agua, tierra, todo tipo de polvo y tierra, partículas, son parte de todo, todos una parte de todo lo que está en todo. Por lo tanto, canta así y su canción es la vida, y vida es una semilla de estrellas, el polvo de los soles y las lunas, las rocas y el polvo, y el humo sideral del espacio sideral a flote en un baño sin temporalidad, contados, medidos, enumerados por alguna especie, a los otros no importa. La ciencia y las matemáticas tratan de trazar la poesía en movimiento, un poco de actividad en la curva de una hélice y la vida en la tierra se hace visible a ti y a simple vista. We're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna do a dual show now. We'll go on the road. I do English, she's in Spanish. I have a girl, bikini. So. <laughs> okay, questions, right? Yeah. Okay.
so this one's in the back, I think. In the back, yeah. yes? Um, I have a many questions, but I'm going to ask just three questions. Wow. Okay. One is um, the importance of identity. I am a Puerto Rican from Ohio. I actually graduated from Kent State University. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was a journalist for 30 years. Now I'm a professor at Lincoln College. But I find that Puerto Ricans who grow up on the mainland really, really are struggling with identity. What is the importance of identity? My second question is the N-word, which I don't like to use because I think it's a politically correct term, but I have a hard time with it because I've studied the word, and I think it's a dehumanizing word. It's a way that they allow people to be lynched, black people to be lynched in the South. I don't let my students use it in the class. I don't want to hear it. Um, I, I really have a hard time with that word. And my, my, my third question is, you talk about your granddaughter coming out of the womb. You know, I mean, I, I see with my students the technology, the issue of technology. Um, uh, and they, they know how to do all this stuff, but they don't read books. They don't read, and you talked about, like, there's no books. They don't read, and I'm teaching, um, I was a reporter for 30 years at very prestigious institutions, um, and I am shocked by the fact that they don't read. They just don't read, but mm -hmm. they know how to do all this technological stuff. But I am teaching mostly black, Latino, and immigrant students, and technology is not working for them. It just isn't working for them. So what is the role? What is our role as educators, particularly for young Latino, black, immigrant students? Mm -hmm. So there's three questions there. <laughs> so identity, the N-word, and, and technology, way, right? Uh, Alan Ginsberg said, you know, and I worked for, I'm telling you, I worked for very prestigious places. Um, I thought all the time about the images of Puerto Ricans, Latinos, um, uh, and you know, Allen Ginsberg once said, "Those who control the images control the culture." Well, I guess that's true. I mean, this would okay. Let me let me deal with the first part. When culture, okay. Um, when this was all happening back 40 years ago, it was about culture and politics. They were intermingled. For instance, to give you an example. Nowadays, you know, the, say the youth of today, for an example, you know, they go, uh, they're going to shack up an apartment, you know, while they go apply for an apartment. They have a lot of things against them, you know, they're young, blah, blah, no experience. But anyway, they go apply for an apartment. If they feel the landlord is being racially opposed to them, right, racist, you know, they have no problems jumping in his face, right, telling them that, calling the police, you know, finding some way to get the situation resolved. But there was a time when it wasn't like that. You felt that you were being victimized by racism, so what? You tell the police, they'll tell you so. You know what I mean? So what? You know, and there was no no way to get a redress for a grievance, really, you know? So, at, like I said earlier, at that time we all got together and people in different different realms, someone into social science, the arts, you know, whatever, you know what I'm talking about, the whole movement that pushed forward to get stuff done for us to get social services and resources and all of that. So that was a socio, uh, uh, political, a cultural movement at the time and and in fact that even happened before I was around because the earlier Puerto Ricans were still involved with that when they came here so that was always what was happening what I see happening now for the most part or for a large part I don't know if it's the most part but for a very obvious is what I call cultural capitalists who are people that are biting on the culture for the purpose of the capital gain that, that it can garner them. So they're cultural capitalists. They'll use, like, you know, people say, oh, by any means necessary, or all that other stuff, but not within the context of where, where it actually has a place. So everything's, you know, becomes sloganized. You know, I mean, we live in a society where, you know, Jesus is either Santa Claus or a bunny. 
You know, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so anything can get dumbed down or, 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 or bastardized or whatever, and it was our struggle to keep our, that from happening to our culture, except for now, in modern times. You got people that want to bring back the word spick, right? They want to make earrings out of it, or want to, you know, uh, just think it's cool. I can't see nobody calling somebody a spick in love. You know, yo, my spit, what's happening? I, I can't see it. You know, now, yeah, now see, then conversely, you got young people that go around, Puerto Ricans, Latinos, calling themselves niggas, you know, which, yeah, bothers me on the train. You know, it, it really, you know, like, I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to say nothing, but I don't want to hear it, you know. But that's because I think that our whole family unit thing here was broken up. You know, uh, and that was economics, you know, like you had men who came from Puerto Rico, like my father, who was a merchant marine, but couldn't find a damn ship to, you know, to, to bunk in, you know, here, because of racism and the unions and all of that. You have that with the, the unions right now with the, that make movies, you know, whenever you see them shooting a film in New York, right, they're in your damn neighborhood, and how many of those people look like you know, they work, they, they live in your neighborhood. They don't they don't recruit, they bring, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of our men were disenfranchised from the workforce of America and and that hurt their self esteem. The women had to go out and work. They became the head of households. You see what I'm saying? So all of this led to the breakup of, of our family units, you know? And uh, so we got that. Regarding technology, just because you have an iPhone doesn't mean you know how to use it. You know, you just like I got, I got, I got, I got a, a, a prevail something other. All I know how to do is make a phone call. I, I found out I could talk to it. You know, I found out I could talk to it. <laughs> so now I don't have to text message, which was already driving me crazy. <laughs> so I text and I talk. You know, I said, okay, I don't think it's gonna understand this, so I'll text it. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Just the technology is moving so damn fast doesn't mean you can keep up with it. Well, because I have students who don't even know where an apostrophe goes. They don't know how to punctuate. They don't know basic grammar, and they're in a four-year university. But they can do very well with technology, very well. But like I said, just because just you know how to use it doesn't mean you know how to use it. They're not competing against New Yorkers, Americans. They're competing against the world. What do you do with that? Well, Even they know what I would like to do about it is I'd like to go visit schools and universities and talk to people who are going to, as a poet, talk to people who are going to do something or plan something in life, because I think that what's more important is you can become a doctor if you want, you can become a police officer, or you can become president of the United States if you want to, whatever. But, it, but to me what's important is what type of that do you become? You see, who are you in that role? And that's what we can affect, you see. We can affect that, and, and, and I believe in that. And so I, that's what I want to do. I want to go out and spread cheer and talk to our people. And yes, it is in, I have a poem called Human Wisdom, and it's about that. It's not in this book, but it's about keeping culture. Culture is very, very important to keep. You know? I, I'll, I'll be right there, yes, yes. Hey, you, you were talking at the beginning about the contemporaneity uh, of your of your writing and whether you needed to update certain words um, which might change the meaning of the original poetry yeah um, I wonder what you thought about the idea that the greater the specificity whether culturally linguistically of a scene or, or a story or, or a poem that the more specific it is in a sense to a context the greater its universal appeal may be in a sense rather than trying to uh, translate things into contemporary language, distance itself from the immediate time and context in which you wrote and in which you experienced it. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't try to, I don't like changing my poems. Okay, here's the thing. A poem is a hard thing to finish, okay? They're very, very tricky, you know? It's, it's like lines in the sand. Um, and a poem will fool around with you until, <laughs> until finally it's, it's more on the poem than the poet. Um, to finish the poem. Um, now, once a poem is finished, like to me, these poems are finished. There's nothing else I'm going to do to them. 
Um, once the poem is finished, to me it's just, that's it. It's locked. If you have something else to say, go write another damn poem. You know what I mean? Go write another poem. Don't mess with that one. Leave that one alone. Now, in these particular poems, because these poems are kind of like in a period of time, you see what I mean? So they're going to last, they're going to live as long as they live, but in that period of time, they ain't moving out of that time. You see what I mean? One of the things I learned as a poet was to try to write poems that live beyond their own time. Like you, a good example, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. You see what I mean? doesn't matter. Anything with that poem is timeless because it will always be about that, no matter where, no matter when, no matter who encounters it, no matter what their culture is. You see what I mean? And to me, that's the aim. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's write that kind of poetry. You see what I mean? That lasts forever that way. Um, so the poems that, that these are poems of my maturation these poems help me become Papo, the Papo sitting before you right now and everything else they, they helped me become that and that was that was good that they did that for me I'm not going to change them, I, I toyed with that at certain periods in my life but not now when we were putting the book together all I was trying to do was replicate them as they originally were, I didn't want to change anything to them because I wanted to preserve them as they were when I originally wrote them. Do I use the word nigga in a, in a poem now? No, except for the poem um, Kill, 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 which I wrote in 1994 after I was arrested and beat up by the police. And I wrote this poem called Kill, 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 which uh, talks about the police being the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> and it, it invokes the N-word throughout the whole damn poem because that's the type of poem it is. But then I have a poem called A Southern, uh, 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 a San Diego Southern African Night that talks about a black man getting a jaywalking ticket at 3 o'clock in the morning in San Diego. There ain't nobody in the damn street except the police to, ha to harass him. And there's not a curse word in the poem. There's not one curse word in the poem and there's not one reference to niggers or anything else in the poem. But when you finish reading the poem, you felt like somebody just slapped you in the face. You see? So those are the kind of things, you know, that, that I learned. That they tried to uh, uh, rewrite <clears throat> Huckleberry Finn, you know, and take the N-word out. Now, I remember, like I said, you know, I was a silly little kid. I just finished reading Huckleberry Finn a year ago. Okay, for the first time. And I had a great time reading it, okay? I mean, I was having such a great time reading it that when I was halfway through the book, I needed to be on a boat. Okay, <laughs> so what I did, I'm crazy, so what I did was I got on the Second Avenue bus. <laughs> and I took the Second Avenue bus to South Ferry. <laughs> and I got off, and then I had a decision to make. Am I going to Staten Island, or am I going to Governor's Island, which I had never been to before? So I said, okay, we're on this adventure, uh, me and Hook. And I got on the little boat, <laughs> because it looked smaller and rougher. It promised a rougher ride, right? And I was right. <laughs> and it was a real rough ride to get there. And when I got to Governor's Island, I sat under a tree and opened my book. I <laughs> read my book for a few chapters, and I got up and did the same thing going back home. You know why? Because the book inspired me to do that. <laughs> you see? But I remember that when I was reading it, there was an article that came out saying that they wanted to take nigger out of the book. And I remember there was a line in it when uh, uh, Mark Twain, is, <laughs> he says, he says uh, uh, something happens, I forgot where it was, and then the... the, the uh, um, uh, Huck Huckleberry Finn is thinking, well, that was pretty smart for a damn nigga. Now, that's the line, right? That was pretty, like, like in other words, he's saying, like, how the hell could this colored guy, you know, think so beautifully or so profoundly, you know what I mean? And I know that Mark Twain put that in exactly for what it means oppositely. You see what I'm saying? Just to bring up that dichotomy. That you know that that sometimes white racist people were were befuddled by the intelligence of a nigga. You see, what I mean? and how stupid that thought is. You see, you see, it's brilliant. <laughs> yes. I think it's the first over here. Yeah. Over there. Mm -hmm. Listen, I wanted to ask you, right? Your book represents. 
Yeah, your book represents like 40 years of uh, work. And I wanted to know, after having these 40 years in your pocket, how, is it, how easy is it to find uh, a theme or, or a subject to write about? You know, I mean, you, you first started writing, let's say, in the 70s, and there was a lot of things going on in the community and in the world and stuff. I presume it was easier to pick a subject and write about it. You know, how do you feel about that now? Well, a very good question. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, like I said, I was growing up in those days. So when I was a lot younger, I was always writing, you know, whatever, you know, I felt like writing. There's some poems in, in this book, right, that have nothing to do with Puerto Ricans, right? Right, like the old man that, that dies, uh, the, the corn liquor bottle. Where the hell did I get that from? You know what I mean? This is experimental writing, you know what I mean? I'm just experimenting when, when I was doing that uh, a lot of times. Now, I always have something to write about, you know. It's just a matter of whether or not I'm not lazy enough to pick up a pen and deal with it, you know, because I know what's going to happen the minute I put a pen in my hand and try to deal with something. Um, my poetry is generally about what, what I observe people doing to people, like human behavior. You know, that's basically what, my, what I think my poetry is about, little still lives about that. Not, not so much here, because here I'm in, in it. But now you get older, you're not in everything, you know what I mean? It's not all about you. You're just walking down the street like a pedestrian seeing things. And so now how you become affected by them is what I'm responding to, you know, like a, like a home, like you walk into the subway, it's rush hour, it's a.m. rush hour, right? And only half the train is full, right? Like one half of the train is totally packed, and the other half is totally empty, but it's the same car. So you wonder, what the hell's going on here, right? Well, there's this homeless guy who stinks, <laughs> like, oh, how? He's sleeping over there, is he? That's the poem. You see the irony, you see? So right then you walk into the poem and you see the irony. So the irony is what sparks my thing. When I see the irony of something, uh, the dichotomy, you know, the, the hypocrisy of it, then, um, so I always have something to write about. But then there's sometimes I don't want to write about some things. Like, like I don't like to write too critically about our people. Because <laughs> they get mad. You know, <laughs> you know they get mad. Uh, call you a hater and everything. But there's some things that I observe that, that, you know what I mean? So it becomes a hard way to finesse it. Like, why do we exit a grocery store only to stand in front of the entrance? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you can write poetry about that. You know what I'm saying? Because it's all around. You know, so there's some things I don't really want to write about. Hey, hey? Uh, hello there. Uh, thank you, by the way. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Hello. Is that? Okay. You can borrow this one. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to ask. Uh, you brought me back in, you know, in the earlier readings because uh, I'm from El Barrio. I don't want to be in the Barrio sometimes, but mm -hmm. I'm back. Um, and um, have I written? I tried writing once and we got together with some guys that I grew up with, the few guys that left. And in writing some of the some of the anecdotes and material, it was cathartic, you know. Especially when you get back with these guys that you mm -hmm. did shit with, right. and uh, you almost end up apologizing for stuff you did, and that's what we did, you know. So I'm giving this preface because I'm wondering, because you know what I heard, was there a some type of emotional release? Especially when you were 17 years old and you were looking around you and writing about the social, not just the social issues, but your life and the people around you. And has your views from back then, have they changed today? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. My, my views are always evolving, you know. Um, you know, like... Body in specific. Well, yeah, see, see, my advantage is that I left and I went to California. And I lived in California for almost 20 years, like 16 years. And well, and not all in California, because then I moved to Mexico. And I was living in Mexico for a while, climbing pyramids and shit, you know, going to bullfights. And, and, um, 
But um, so all of that. In, in fact, when I hung out with Native Americans in Arizona and in, in Four Corners and, you know, smoked the peace pipe and was there for the Sundance, you know, and the Lakota ceremony and all that, you know, which, you know, I have stuff on. It's not in this book because these, you know, there's 40 years after this book, you know, <laughs> there's other stuff, you know. There's a street, you know, there's concertos on Market Street, which came out in seven, uh, which came out in 92, I think. Um, so these are some poems about the West Coast. 93. 93. My job as a scholar to Thank be a you. total geek See, about uh, dates. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so, so um, a lot went on. Um, and, and, I, and, and I'm always learning stuff, you know what I mean? Like, I, I like, I'm nosy. I like learning stuff. I don't like going to school. And I don't like studying, you know, like books. I have my own way of studying, you know. It's just it's kind of like gloss over. Okay, I know it, <laughs> you know. But but that's how I do things. Um, but any, anyway, I, I don't know if I answered your question. I just you a picture of you. You, you, went, you went away from the barrio, came back, and as a result of it, which I've done also, you grow. Yeah, because you see things differently. It's like I went to I went to go find out where the sun goes down, for instance. You know, when you go west, then you learn that, yeah, now you're as west as you can get. There's no more damn land, and the sun's going over the, um, you know, is, is going over the horizon, which is water, you know. One time I saw dawn. Dawn is the most beautiful thing to see from an airplane. You know, it begins with a little string of light shooting up to the sky. It's lovely, very lovely. It's a very, you, and you got to be at the right place at the right time to see it. So anyway. But um, but the Mexicans, you know, Mexi you know what Mexicans did for me? Mexicans taught me how to speak Spanish better because they would goof me <laughs> for ending my R's with L's uh -huh. and, for, <laughs> and for leaving out S's like in Dio. <laughs> And they were goofed the daylight out of me, you know? So so then, you know, like, my ear started cocking itself. Plus, it's an eight. You know, you do, once you become familiar with it again, it's just like, you know, it's like somebody put a spark plug in there, and, you know, and it all comes back to you, you know? So, uh, so anyway, um, I like writing about everything, you know? But mainly I write about inter human interaction, is, is you know, except unless it has something to do with me. Well, that too. Okay, so I think that's it. Again, let's give a big hand to Papoleto and thanks to the Centro for hosting us. And thank you for coming. Let's buy some books a comprar libros. Uh, yeah, we have some books for sale. I don't know. I brought a bunch of books. I don't know. So I don't want to take them home. I mean, I'm not going to give them to you. Though. Thank you, bro. Great job. Great. 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 Great.